Let's continue then our discussion of institutions um, that uh, compose the political systems of modern democracies, talking about how <coughs> they make policy. We talked about briefly about policy, so let's let's define again, uh, review these two uh, definitions: what is an institution and what is a policy. An institution, therefore, um, as we discussed last time, is a set of uh, is a group of people uh, pursuing the same goals following the same rules with constancy in time, with continuation in time, right? So, um, <clears throat> this, these institutions can be formal and informal, you don't have to have a building for them, again, as I give, gave the example last time, um, a group of people going bowling every week and then discussing politics, uh, if, if that continues week after week after week, it shapes the life of those people. Right? Uh, it, it transforms society. So that's, that's already an institution. So a set of rules, I mean, the simplest, bare-bones um, definition of an institution is a set of rules. But obviously that applies to a group of people, and they need to have persistence in, in time, and obviously to pursue a common set of goals. Right? Uh, what is a policy? Right? Policy is the essence of govern, govern, governing. Um, <clears throat> the, the road right, is from idea to reality. So policy is the connection between idea and reality, right? Ideas which are actually bills, which are proposals of rules, right? Are transformed then in laws, which are rules, definitions of rules, which then uh, are implemented and that is reality, right? And governing means taking it from here to here. And it doesn't have to be democratic. What differentiates a democratic government is that these ideas are meant to reflect or to be connected with the will of the people. Right? But that's very vague and as you well know, uh, it's a more complex issue. Is it really that uh, representatives go around and collect the ideas of the people? And where do the people get their ideas from? Right? We're going to talk about this a little bit later in this section. Uh, <coughs> we're going to discuss the fact that political figures, leaders, representatives, right? They are actually opinion makers and shapers, uh, not just represent, uh, people who represent these uh, opinions, right? Where do you get your ideas of what is right, what is wrong, in the sense of politically, you know, what is on the right, what is on the left, what is conservative, liberal, whatever, <coughs> all kinds of ideologies, well, you learn them, right? And it's the, politi uh, the political uh, actors themselves who define these choices. But I just went ahead right now. Let's pull back and um, <clears throat> go back to institutions that transform ideas into reality. So this is a function of any government. Starts from ideas. Even a, a dictator, Saddam Hussein, had an idea, became reality by making it into a law that he could what enforce, implement. And that, but in a democracy, we also have the issue of representation. Uh, we also have other aspects such as. Uh, rights, liberties, uh, which we will analyze in more detail in the next section, section when we talk about the requirements for a system to be democratic. But let's stick with one central idea, which is that of representation. So, in a democracy, we talked about the fact that the main institutions divide their responsibilities. Uh, the legislatures are meant to uh, make laws uh, by representing the various ideas in, in, in the population, representing the different ideas from the population in this institution, and according to certain rules, transforming those ideas into, right, from bill to law. But then the law needs to be implemented, and that is the role of the, of the executive, right, which implements uh, laws. Of course, we talked about the fact that the, the modern executive is both meant to implement laws, but because of its uniqueness, because of the fact that the head of the executive occupies such a prominent, visible spot, and with the growth of the power of modern government and of modern states, the heads of the executives, no matter the political system, the democratic political system, they also play a role of leadership. Right? So implementation, but also leadership. And we listed yesterday, uh, last time for the four major roles of um, the head of the executive. Right? Uh, just check the previous lecture. So, <clears throat> today we will look at the four case studies, and again, and again, and again, we will go back to the four case studies, to the US, UK, Germany, France, 
and see how all these realities are lived out, applied there. This is why it's useful to have such a, such a backbone on which to project our discussion. Because we talk about this in abstract, but let's see how it happens. And we have all these three major forms of uh, modern representative democracies, which are parliamentary, semi-presidential, presidential. presidential. Uh, so how does this happen in each? So before uh, we go there, let's uh, say a few words about legislatures. Uh, legislatures, we talked about them, we talked about their functions, again, look at, uh, <coughs> look at your notes uh, on the last lecture, the, the roles of the legislature. But there are a few other things that I would like to add. As you, as you noticed, in, most of the, in all four case studies that we have studied, uh, the legislatures are, and I use this word, bicameral. Right? And that it means that it has, they have two chambers. So indeed, in terms of structure, legislature around the world are of two kinds. So when you talk about legislatures, they are of uh, two kinds in terms of structure. They can be unicameral or bicameral. And it's very simple. Uni, bi means one chamber or two chambers. Camera means chambers, right? Or houses. Right? Um, <clears throat> in, in fact, the most, most often than not, they are unicameral. 63% more or less of the countries around the world, of the states around the world, have unicameral legislatures. Now, what is the advantage of your unicameral legislature where there are fewer people you pay to represent you, right? Where does this work? Well, obviously, when you have uh, smaller countries or more homogeneous countries, why would you need two houses? Uh, what are the disadvantages? Well, one house can pass anything and it doesn't have a check. It can make a mistake. When you have a bicameral house, well, you have a check on that. And of course, why not three, why not four, why not seven, right? So, this takes us to the question, why bicameral? Which Countries have bicameral um, uh, legislatures. And you saw in the case of France that it, it's not very clear why France has an upper house. The Senate, if it has the French people, we are not sure. We are not sure. Um, and you notice also, and this is a different discussion, uh, you notice also how weak the Senate is in uh, France. So why bicameral, right? What would, why would you have two houses? Well, usually it is because... What is the role of uh, the legislature, right? A crucial role is that of representation, to represent. Well, in a state, the legislatures represent the state, but the state can be constituted in different ways, right? The state can be unitary, meaning it's all one under one government, or can be federal or confederal, right? Which means that there are several units which themselves compose the state, right? And these units are different from local governments such as mayor, uh, cities, towns, counties, and so on. These are component uh, units of the state. So, for example, the U.S. is comp uh, com um, the U.S. is made out of the people who live in the U.S. and the states separately, distinctly. These both of them are actors, uh, and which constitute the U.S. as a state. Same with German, right? The people constitute the uh, state of Germany, and the Länder, right, the, the, the regions, represent, constitute, in, independently, concurrently. So, the question is, why would you have two houses? Well, you will have two houses when you need to represent two different things that constitute that state. And those different things can be of different kinds. So, one house will, because we talk about democracy, will represent the people, right, popular elected. But the other house can represent other things. And uh, so why bicameral, right? And one reason for being bicameral is when you have a federal state, the upper house will represent the federal units themselves, right? Uh, as in Germany, as in the US, as in the Russian Federation. It's a federation. So the upper house will be the representatives not of, of the people, but of the, com the other component units. But that's not the only reason to have an upper house. Uh, in the UK, you saw that the upper house represents uh, specific groups in the population for very specific historical reasons that we have discussed. So the House of Lords, as the name says it, represents what? Nobility, 
than life peers, people who are appointed because of their special merits, than bishops and archbishops of the Church of England. And all of this comes from, from history and it's in continuous transformation. It's only 15 years ago that the number of the uh, 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 lords who were uh, who obtained their, their, their position in the House of Lords through, through, through inheritance, you know, through family, has been cut from thousands, thousands, to about 90. Yeah? There is an ongoing process of reform. And they don't know where it's going because, you know, you, you want an upper house, but should we still maintain this sort of a class dimension or not? But, so that can be another example, right? When there's, an, there's a historical heritage of a class society where specific groups form the parliament and this is a vestige of that. But there can be another uh, reason, similar but distinct, in which the upper house represents specific groups in the population, not classes, but groups. For example, professional groups, um, um, vocational uh, groups. And this is the model of the medieval guilds. And Slovenia has such an upper house where the upper house is representatives of, say, students, doctors, uh, teachers, and so on. You see, it's sort of a, a vocational representation. It's quite fascinating. Uh, Ireland, the Republic of Ireland, has a similar upper house, where it's the it's more complex. They're elected, but again, they represent different groups in the society. So it's sort of a <coughs> um, organic, uh, more organic uh, uh, representation, uh, complementing the popular uh, representation. So bicameral, it needs to when whenever you see a bicameral. Legislature, ask yourself why. And obviously, in most cases, a bicameral legislation will be there because, uh, well, in, in larger countries, because larger countries have are probably more diverse, which means that you have different things to represent. This is why the U.S. is a federal state. Because first of all, because it's large, and uh, um, you know, and when it was, of course, you have the founding and the colonies and so on. But but size matters because size also brings specific regional, which can be also cultural, linguistic, whatever, diversity, right? And those diversities need to be represented distinctly. Canada is a good example of that. Okay, another way to uh, talk about legislature is to talk about their powers. And basically, when you talk about powers, not in, not in relation to the executive, but in relation to each other. So bicameral legislature can be balanced, in which the two, <clears throat> in which the two houses, lower and upper, and again, lower and upper doesn't mean upper is more powerful than the lower. Actually, it's the other way around usually. So balance means when the two houses are basically equal in power, and probably, uh, I mean, the U.S. has one of the most balanced bicameral systems in the world. Some would say that the Senate is even more, slightly more powerful, but it's not really. Uh, they're very balanced. Germany has a, a somewhat well, tends towards balance, but it is unequal because the lower house can bypass the veto of the upper house, which is not the case in the U.S. In the U.S., both houses need to pass a bill, pass become a, in order for it to become a law in identical form, and no 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 house can bypass or can <coughs> uh, no house has a tool to defeat the veto of the other house. So they're equal. So this is a balanced bicameralism, and then there is imbalanced or unequal bicameralism, bicameralism, in which obviously the two houses are unequal. And if you would have, if you, if we could make a chart of the four case studies that we have we have looked at, uh, I think we can say that the most balanced is the U.S., and then moving towards imbalanced, we can go to. Uh, Obviously, the next one is Germany, where the upper house is quite, quite significant, but with very specific roles. Then, probably, uh, the Senate in France, and last on the list is the House of Lords. So, the UK is probably the most imbalanced, uh, has the most imbalanced legislature in terms of the powers, because the House of Commons is much more powerful than the House of Lords. In terms of size, legislatures, that's another way in which we can talk about them. 
there's not much to say. The point is that it varies enormously depending on the size of the country. You can have just 15, 17. There are some island states which have a legislature that is only, you know, in the tens, 15, 17. Uh, but then you have you can have hundreds or thousands as the House of Lords used to be. So it depends on size, but also on tradition and so on. <clears throat> in terms of a general development of legislatures. What has to be noted, and the U.S. is a good case study in this uh, sense, is that they have lost a lot of power. Understand that the legislature, the, the, this was a, the huge win, conquest of democracy in the 19th century. People were represented, right? Uh, no taxation without representation. People were represented. And this is why the founders, for example, in the U.S. Have, uh, gave most of the power to the Congress, not to the president. And yet now we think sort of the popular imagination has the president, uh, Harrison Ford playing the president in Air Force One, right? He's the key figure. Well, why? It's not in the Constitution. What happened is that in the last 100, 150 years, the, 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 the central government has acquired, has uh, lots of powers that it didn't have before, the executive mainly, uh, responsibilities that it didn't have before, think of the New Deal in the US, and with responsibility comes also power, and it has grown significantly. And then also this idea of the need for a visible one leader. Uh, that the, you know, it's, this is why the unique president, uh, unique position of the head of the executive, is confers this sort of a gives this sort of a leadership quality. So, long story short, the executive has grown in power, and the legislatures usually have lost power in the 20th century. How democratic is that? Think of the fact that the Congress today is, um, has one of the lowest popular, uh, uh, you know, <coughs> is ranked as one of the most unpopular institutions, unpopular institutions in the U.S. Uh, political system. Uh, if I ask your colleagues, ask yourself, what's your opinion of the Congress? Many will say, "Oh, those people bickering there." But see, it's the same. It's the same um, perception. You want clear leadership. You, I mean, we want clear leadership, but how democratic is that? A dictator is a clear leader, right? So, this is why it's important to understand the role of legislatures. How important it is to understand that they are the essence of democracy. Because they, they here's where the ideas in the population get battled out and so on. So, legislatures have decreased in power for all these reasons. One, the growth of the modern state, in terms of its responsibilities and powers, and second, um, just the, the need for uni unified action at the level of uh, government. And the head of the executive is always in the position to become that sort of a unified uh, figure, unifying and unified uh, center of action. Good. So let's uh, let's then look at um, the process of policy making, of making policy, of transforming ideas into reality in these uh, four uh, case studies. And in this process, right, it, it, the idea gets into the government through representation, so we're not going to cover that now, you know, elections basically, uh, and parties, but what we're going to cover is what happens when from um, that having an idea where does it come from, specifically, to having a bill introduced into the legislative chamber, because the only house, the only institution that can pa pass laws, right, well, theoretically, is the legislature. So, from idea to introducing a bill in the legislation to how does it happen that it becomes into a law, and then it goes to be implemented at the executive. And the next video lecture, we'll talk about the process of implementation. We'll briefly cover this when we talk about uh, the executive and the administration or bureaucracy. But we will study in more detail the executive, the cabinet, and the administration or bureaucracy, which are the engines that run a country. But that's going to be the next lecture. Today, we're going to look at lawmaking. How do you go from idea to bill to law? So let's look at the US, right? Uh, in the US, Right? You have what? You have two houses. The House of Representatives and 
and the Senate. Lower and upper house, right? And what, and then you have the executive. And what is characteristic for the, one of the characteristics of the presidential political system that the US has is that there is a separation of powers, right? Again, what does this mean? It means that the legislative power and the executive power are given specifically, separately, distinctly, and almost exclusively to different institutions. So all the legislative function is here, and all the executive function is here. Now there's also a, a slight overlap in these functions, and that's what we call checks and balances. The legislature sharing a little bit in the executive function, but the principle of the separation of powers is that all the legislative power goes here, all the executive powers to, power goes here, and the reason for this, for this was the concern of the framers that if you give all these powers, if you give both powers, that's not even talk about the judicial power, to one institution, it's going to abuse it. So let's divide these different functions of the state to different institutions that are elected differently and removed differently, so they're autonomous from each other. And in this case, so you divide the government. That's the idea. You divide the government, the functions of the government. That's the US thought. So how does, that it, how does it work then in this model? How does an idea become a bill, become a law? And what is the role of the executive then? Because seemingly it doesn't have any role, right? It's only there to execute, check the, check the constitution. And how does this work with what we just said, with the rise of the modern executive? Well, it turns out the executive plays a, an important role, interestingly enough. So in the US, it's very simple. A bill can only be introduced by a member of the lower or the upper house, in that given house. But for all, in order to, to pass a bill, both houses need to pass it in the exact same form. So they will both pass to uh, each their own bill. You know, sometimes there's a bill passed here, the Senate will not even, you know, doesn't even care about that bill. They're independent, these houses. They're separate from each other. But in order to have it a law, they both need to be passed in the same identical form. If they can't reach a, an identical form, then the, it goes to a so-called conference committee, where representatives from each house is meet and they decide on a final version here. Right? So that's it. It's very simple. Bills can only be introduced here or here or in both places. They need to be passed by both houses. If they don't agree, uh, conference committee. So where do the ideas come from? Well, the ideas can come from anywhere. They can come from individual uh, representatives, individually as groups, uh, some interest groups, you know, lobbies, people, doesn't matter. But here's where the executive can play a role, because the executive, can, the executive cannot introduce a bill. Only members of Congress can introduce a bill of the lower house, House of Representatives, or upper house Senate. But ideas can come from anywhere. And here's where the executive can play a role. And the president, with having this unique popular function, he plays, and with the growth of the modern government, he plays this unique role, in which sometimes, because um, American parties are very, very decentralized, and it's very hard to you know, rein, them, rein the members in. It's like herding cats, because they're all independent actors, uh, all individual representatives. You don't have a clear leader of a party. If I ask you who's the leader of a party, you're going to say the president. Well, he's not the leader of any party. He's just the president. He doesn't have the title of the president of a party. He's not. He's not the leader of that organization. There is no such thing in the US. So they're very disorganized in, in a way, these parties. So it's hard to keep them in, in touch. This is why the president, by virtue of his position, and the leaders of each house, the speaker of the house, and the, uh, the majority leader of the Senate, um, they play a sort of a, a leadership role, but they're not the leader of the party. They're leader of the party here, leader of the party here, and important person in the party there. Right? Long story short is that the president has a very unique visible position, and he can rally public attention by speaking, really, to issues. So the parties here or here, especially his party, ex expect sort of the president to, to give an impulse to... to to policy making, although he has no role in lawmaking, zero. But what he can do, because he runs this huge apparatus and he has this prestigious position, it has grown into the fact that the president can, he and his team, you know, they can prepare ideas of laws. Again, for that, 
in together with uh, people from these houses or these uh, these people from these houses work with the president and their team to prepare ideas of laws. Well, again, this is not in the Constitution. Not that it's unconstitutional because the idea is that lawmaking happens only here and only here. The president cannot introduce a law. But he plays a more formal or informal leadership role sometimes. But here's the, this, here's the trick. He cannot make any law cannot make anyone introduce a bill. He cannot make anyone agree to a plan. It's a give and take, it's a fascinating continuous give and take in which it all depends basically on the president's position in the polls more than anything and on his personal relationships of him, of his team with the different parties in Congress. That's how complicated it is. Simple in fact, but that's how complex and in intricate it is. Uh, or interesting rather. So, but Ideas can come from anything. The president can play a leadership role, but it really depends on people here. And sometimes people from the same party will oppose the president because you know they have their own ideas. Bills need to be passed by both houses. They need to be passed in the same identical form. If not, the conference committee, after a bill is passed, it goes to the president to sign it. Only the president can refuse to sign it, and but this veto can be overcome with two thirds of uh, the Congress. So if two-thirds of the houses uh, can overcome the presidential veto. That's about it. It's very, quite simple. So, but you see how I told you what is the definition of the political system. The definition of the political system <clears throat> is that the political system is the relationship of power uh, between the different institutions of the state. A state is a set of institutions. The political system is how power is distributed between those institutions and what the relationship is between them, which is what shapes the different way in which countries are governed. This was a presidential system. In a parliamentary system such as the UK, which has two houses, right? House of Commons and House of Lords. And then you have an executive led by a prime minister, you have a ceremonial monarch, the cabinet. But here, this is a parliamentary system, and remember, the only elected body here is the House of Commons, and the executive is basically an arm of the House of Commons, so much so that the prime minister and the members of the cabinet are members in the House of Commons or House of Lords. They have to be. Their own, all the power of the executive comes from here. So what you have here, opposite from the U.S. is a fusion of powers. They're not that they're, se they're, they're far from being separated, they're intertwined. So much so that from the majority party, a good number of these people will actually also be here. And the Prime Minister is the leader of the majority party. Right? So it's intertwined. So clearly then, the lawmaking process will reflect this. There won't, be, there won't be any separation of powers. It's a fusion of powers. So law in lawmaking, the executive, which is just an arm of the legislature, will play a key role. Indeed, in the UK, ideas, again, can come from many places. But mostly they come from, from the prime minister and the cabinet. A very important actor here is the bureaucracy, which in Britain is called Whitehall. Whitehall. Why so? Because that's where it's located. And it's huge. And bureaucracy, we'll talk about the bureaucracy in, in the UK, but it's huge and very professional. So most, most um, laws are worked up here with the bureaucracy, with the specialists, and then introduced to the House of Commons. Or the House of Lords, doesn't matter. They can introduce it either way. Then this bill needs to be passed by both houses, but here is where the imbalance unequal bicameralism comes into play. Most power is here, in the House of Commons. The roles of the House of Lords, as I mentioned, being unelected, they diminished continuously. So right now, the House of Lords can only, is meant to be more of an expertise-giving upper house. They tweak the law, they give time for debate. There's little debate here, by the way, of the laws. Why? Because remember, all the members of the executive are the leaders of the majority party. The debate happens here. And very often it's, it's just run through the 
House of Commons, why would they oppose <coughs> a bill written by themselves? Right? So, but when it goes to the House of Lords where there is no party domination, it's a mixed thing um, because of its mixed composition, lords and appointed for life and bishops, they debate it. It's a house of debate. Yeah. But what can they do? Can they refuse it? Not really. No. They can't really veto. They can bring amendments. You know, the House of Lords criticism or opposition has a public impact. They can shape public opinion. They can delay. The most they can do is delay laws. Uh, one law they can delay any law they can delay any law for a week, for a year. But money money bills, meaning bills that have to do with financial issues, they can only delay for a month. And actually, most of those are just go easily through the House of Commons. Most of the financial power is here. And remember, I told you. If you want to know what, how much power a legislature has, ask how much power it has over the purse. The power of the purse, of the budget, finances, and so on. And in the US, all budget needs to be passed and starts from and ends in where? In the Congress. Huge power. Even if it's not used, sometimes. Here, they, it's the House of Commons, really, which has this power. But because of the mechanisms of a parliamentary system in which the parliament as the representative of the people, this is a democratic principle, right? All power comes, is here, but they delegate it to the executive who is still themselves, right? A good number of these people, really, large number, hundred and something of them are here in the executive, right? So clearly you have a domination of the executive over the House of Commons as an institution. It's still the same party, the same people, but as an institution, there is a domination of the executive. So, in any case, the bill needs to be passed by the House of Commons. The House of Lords can tweak it, bring some amendments. After it is passed by both houses, it goes to the monarch. Because that's the head of state. Head of government. It's the head of state who signs. And the president in the US, he signs it because he's head of state, not because he's the head of government. Can the monarch refuse to sign? The monarch, it is the custom, it's unwritten, but it's the custom, the monarch signs uh, all, all the bills. And that's it. So the most important actor you see then here is the PM, actually, who is also the leader of the majority party. So let's look at another model, which, which is France, which is a semi-presidential. And here you'll see again the characteristics of a semi-presidential system, which is in between presidential and parliamentary. The lower house, the National Assembly, is the more powerful house, and the upper house, the Senate, is weaker, but the National Assembly <coughs> is itself an actually fairly weak house. Of all the four Systems we have examined, US, UK, France, Germany, this is probably the weakest lower house in comparative to the executive. So the executive here, as you remember, there's a prime minister, a cabinet, and the president. Right? President who is head of state and head of government one, head of government two. And you have this interesting situation in which the prime minister can be removed by both <laughs> the lower house and the head of uh, the executive, the head of state. Uh, he's appointed by the head of state, can be removed by the head of state, but can also be removed by the National Assembly. Because the president is both head of state and head of government one, right? But, and most policy, remember, in France comes from, I mean, the, the person, excuse me, who shapes the direction of policy in, in France, this is why it's head of government one, is the president. He shapes the grand directions of policy. He can sit into meetings of the cabinet. He is the big honcho, right? Prime Minister is sort of an operator, uh, manager, uh, an implementor, right? So the leadership position versus the implementation function. The leadership function, implementation function. So, appropriately then, and who are the two uh, institutions directly elected in the French political system? National Assembly and President. <clears throat> so, huge uh, popular mandate. But again, here you have a, an executive role, also direct election and so on. 
So how are laws uh, made fast in, in France? Well, again, the president shapes the grand directions of policy. So when you ask where do ideas come from, well, they can come from many places, but the one who shapes the direction of the country is the president. Unlike in the US, he actually has the tools to do that. And the prime minister and the cabinet executives. In the US, the president cannot make anyone do anything. The president here can. Of course, he needs a, a majority here, a coalition majority that supports the passing of the law. That's still true. But there are many provisions in the French Constitution, although some have been reformed lately, by which the, the executive, this being the executive together, right, um, can push laws through the National Assembly with limited debate. They can impose certain things. They can ask for confidence on certain laws, which means that if you don't pass this law, we resign. And you don't want political instability, this might be a government supported by the party, so this is how they push controversial laws through, because, well, what are you going to do next, right? Who's going to replace them? So 85% actually of the, of the bills that are passed come from the executive. And it's the executive who introduces it in the, in the, uh, in the parliament. Power of the purse. Well, there's actually not much power the National Assembly has over budget. Again, constitutionally, think the goal. We, we talked about the, his model of, you know, uh, uh, leadership and of president, right? There's not much that, uh, you, uh, you know, the National Assembly can do about uh, the budget and so on. Here's significant power. So, laws can be introduced either here or here first, doesn't matter. But I'm just, you know, show that, you know, let's say the executive introduces it here into the National Assembly, and then <clears throat> there's debate, and then it goes to the other house. If it's introduced first here, it goes to the other house, the same process, of course. They both need to reach the same, so first it goes into one house, then into the other. Same in the UK, not in the US. In the US they can be almost in parallel, or it doesn't matter, they're independent. Um, and... Both houses, however, need to pass it in the same form. This is a fairly weak Senate, remember, just stronger than the House of Lords in comparison to the lower house, but still weak. So what can the Senate do? The Senate um, can actually have a veto, well, not a veto, but a, it can refuse to pass certain laws. Let's call it a veto. That come from the National Assembly, but the National Assembly can bypass that veto simply votes again, and with the, uh, if the executive insists, the National Assembly can pass it over the opposition of the Senate. So you see, this is a, weak, <laughs> a weakness. Because in the US, where there is a very balanced bicameralism, the lower house, House of Representatives, cannot pass along over the opposition of the Senate. They only each independent, and they each independently need to pass the same law. Um, so, the Senate here cannot refuse to pass a law except for things that the House of Lords cannot do, except for constitutional amendments and other important institutional uh, organ uh, organic changes, for example, laws that change the very powers of the Senate or laws that affect certain uh, uh, important issues in the state, such as borders of counties or local administration powers and so on, or borders. So in such, they're called organic laws, important laws that affect the very institution of the Senate or the state, or a constitutional amendment, the Senate has an absolute veto power. And that gives it a power that the House of Lords doesn't have. Um, so once they're, they're passed by both houses, then um, the, the, the law goes to the president who can sign it. Of course, he can, again, uh, um, veto it. And there is a, a procedure to bypass that veto, but again, it needs a super majority in, uh, in, in, in both houses. So the president needs to sign. But since both bills come from here, I mean, clearly they will be signed because they came from the executive. It's more complicated when you have a divided government, when the PM and the president are from two different political parties. We talked about that situation when the PM is much more powerful and he becomes an independent actor. It's rare, but it happens. And in that case, the president's signature is a very powerful tool, very powerful tool, because, again, that sort of a 
uh, his veto can only be bypassed if two thirds of both houses. It's hard to get. It's hard to get. So a veto can be an important tool, but most of the time it's not needed because most of the policies, policies come from the president and the executive are ran through. They're a little similar to the House of Commons, but even weaker. National Assembly large and not very important, although recently it has been improved. Think about the goal and think about the fact that it, this is a result of the fact that the previous political system in France, uh, the Fourth Republic, which ended with the Algerian Civil War, uh, was characterized by fragmentation and too much power. So this is a rehashing of that, a change of that in order to give more power to the executive to make it more stable, uh, the whole political system. So that's the, that's the, so once the president signs it, it's done. So clearly, here's the most important guy. He can just run the country, and theoretically, he could. There hasn't been a, a lady president yet. So theoretically, he, he could, because most bills come from here, ran through, you know, if needed. Senate, not so much. Veto, signed. So more, more power to pass laws than the US president, for sure. The US president doesn't have any power. <laughs> to introduce a bill, for example. You can just sign a veto, basically, theoretically. So how does it happen that you have so many economic and social crises in France? Even today, the president has the historically lowest, current president has the historically lowest approval ratings. Why? Because once a law is passed, it also needs to be accepted into the society. So here's the implementation part, which we are not covering in this section, uh, not today, excuse me, which is crucial, that laws need to be implemented. But the implementation means that the society needs to approve, um, well, accept the law. And France has a long history of social uh, revolt, of social upheaval, of social, uh, very vocal social uh, non-cooperation with, with the government. And perhaps that's a function also of the fact of how weak the National Assembly is. Because, you see, the legislatures have the role of giving voice to the, what happens in the society. And if, if it doesn't happen here, if that debate, in, if those opposition, if that popular opposition, for example, does, is not here, it's going to be here in the, in the society. This is why how important, how powerful these uh, institutions are is, is crucial. It's crucial for democracy. Because remember, the only alternative to politics is, is, is violence. The only alternative to politics is violence. Because politics, especially democratic politics, is a means of transferring conflicts that are inescapable in any society into a, into a set of, uh, into a framework of rules that transform that conflict of ideas, which is, again, inherent in every society, transforms it, transforms it into an action. We disagree here. But instead of fighting it out on the streets, no, no, live the way I want, no, no, no seatbelt, yes seatbelt, no marijuana, yes marijuana, whatever it is. Instead of fighting it out here, we have a, uh, institutions where we send people to, to, to fight it out according to a set of rules. That's what politics is. Transforming conflict into solutions. Not necessarily good ones, but solutions. That's the idea. Finally, <clears throat> Germany, or the German Federal Republic, the Republic of Germany, again a parliamentary system, but a different one, right? Because it's in a federal state. Parliamentary system, just like the UK, but a, a different bicameral system. Lower House, Bundestag. Lower, upper House Bundesrat, Federal um, Assembly, Federal Council. Remember, directly elected, appointed by the provinces, by the regions. And being a parliamentary system, all power is with Parliament. So the executive, right, there will be two heads of the executive. One will be head of state, which is the president. Formal, ceremonial, symbolic powers, and head of government, real action, the chancellor, and cabinet, and so on. And just like in any parliamentary system, the only elected, directly elected institution in the country is this. Popularly elected. So the executive will derive its power, its mandate from here. 
In a democracy, mandate comes from the people. The mandate to govern, the legitimate mandate to govern comes from the people. So, who will be the chancellor? The chancellor will usually be the head of the majority party, maybe it's a coalition, but still the, of the largest party. Members in the cabinet will be leaders of these parties. Um, the same system as in the UK. Uh, logic, the same logic. This is why it's called parliamentary, because most power is with parliament. So how will then lawmaking happen? So obviously the, part, the house, the lower house will have huge power. And you can compare it with um, uh, <coughs> House of Representatives. Um, it's one of the most powerful lower houses. And it is also one of the most powerful upper houses. In a, but, but the roles, in, it's a different thing from the US because in the US the role is identical of the two houses with very minor differences. Here they have very specific different roles. So anyway, where do bills come from? Well, bills can come from many places. What you have to understand about policy making in, in uh, the Germany, in, in France, it is driven by politicians, but then it always has to meet the public's approval or refusal. And that's always a gamble. That's always a, you know, uh, a complicated issue. Here, so you have you know, politicians passing the law, and then let's see what happens in the public. It's like two poles of the equation. Here is different. Here, the very process of policy making, just like German politics in general, is based on um, cooperation and consensus building. It doesn't mean that everybody agrees and holds hands and sings kumbaya. It means that all the actors in the society, based on their historic experience of uh, Hitler and Weimar Republic, when society was very fragmented, also, they have learned. And today, the, the, the psyche, the, the political culture is, we need to do it together. You can't have groups in the population that are failing while others are succeeding. We can't allow such divisions in the society because that leads to chaos and that leads to instability and that leads to Hitler, basically. So the, we need to win or lose together, succeed or fail together. That's in the, that is different, very different from the competitive winner, win or lose, zero-sum game uh, politics that characterizes the UK or the US. Here it's like, oh, it's either labor or it's business. Policy making in Germany is based on, no, 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 it's both. There are different interests, but you can't, one cannot, if one wins and the other loses, everyone loses. It's untenable. So, this is called the social market, social market economy. Not socialistic or whatever, don't, don't miss, you are in political science introduction class, don't misuse the terms. Uh, social market economy, in the sense that everybody is part of the decision making. And I'm you know, just going to give you a very brief example because we need to talk about this <coughs> process itself. Um, in German factory, German firms, any German firm with over uh, 2,000 employees, 50% of the seats on the management, on the board of the firm, in every firm by law, 50% of the seats on the board are occupied by the workers' representatives. The workers from that firm, not labor, uni not unions. Those who work in the firm, they, own, they elect their own representatives in the board. What does this result in? So 50% workers' representatives, 50% you know, management owners, whatever. What does it mean? It means that tough decisions involve the workers. We need to cut salary to work longer hours. Well, I know. I took the decision together to do this because we, we, have, we see this is the only solution. On the other hand, we also have these benefits, but you can have more because otherwise the firm goes bankrupt. So it's involving all partners in the decision-making process. And that applies to everything in Germany, from the healthcare system to, in the healthcare, the doctors, patients, nurses, uh, state organizations, all, all together are part of the management of the, of the different local health groups and so on. So this is just an example of the model. And you see this principle also happens here. So the Chancellor is the most powerful actor, but again, Bundestag is very powerful, Bundesrat, and so on. But remember that the Cabinet and the Chancellor are the leaders of the majority. So again, there's no intention in... I mean, working together is even a stretch, because they're part of the same party groups and so on. So, bills can come from anywhere. Can come from here, come from here, come from here, come from the 
different groups in the society, as I said, come from the lender, right? The regions can propose bills. Like, like in the US, the states governors would propose bills, right? <clears throat> and so on. But by constitution, all power of the purse, all budget and finance, all budget and taxation laws come from here. You might say, hello, but this is kind of a giving too much power to the executive. No, it's in the interest of stability, learning from the Weimar Republic failure, economic failure. So in the interest of a unified economic policy or budget, bills come from here, and that's in the Constitution. So, anyone can propose bills. Mostly they're discussed in the cabinet with different ministers, the chancellor, but they bring in all the groups in the society that will be affected. They bring in heads of ministers from the different lender. Remember, this is what the Bundesrat members are. They're members in the different cabinets of the different lender, right? And so they lead the policy implementation here. They're the executives here. So they know what works and because they're going to be the ones who implement it. So they come to give to give their input and so on. So, bills are first introduced in the upper house because these are the experts, right? Remember, they are the governments in each region. These are members of the governments in each region who are sent here to do this, to give their expertise. Because most policy implementation, making it into from law to reality, happens here. In the land, not here. Here's where most bureaucracy, when we talk about bureaucracy, is, is in each individual land. This is what means that it's federal. And they also make their own policies, by the way. So first it goes to the Bundesrat, where they give tweaking and expertise. Then it goes to the Bundestag, where there is serious debate. The Bundestag is very powerful. And then <coughs> it is sent with the, in the final version. So this is an initial tweaking. Well, this is not going to work, whatever, it's kind of a general. Then it goes here where the thorough debate of the representatives of the people, that's where it happens. Then it goes back to the Bundesrat for, uh, with the final version, and the Bundesrat can um, basically doesn't have an absolute power of veto except for certain issues, just like in France. But it has a suspensive veto, meaning that if the Bundesrat refuses a bill with half uh, plus one, simple majority, 50% plus one, the Bundestag will have to pass it with a majority. But if the Bundestag refuses a bill with two-thirds majority, with a, over, a large majority, <coughs> extra, extraordinary majority, then the Bundestag also will have to pass it with more than two-thirds. So, briefly put, a bill is sent to the Bundesrat for initial tweaking, then to the Bundestag, the lower house, where the real work on the bills happen, very thorough committees, serious work. And the final version get, goes back to the Bundesrat for final approval. Bundesrat basically can, you know, can veto it, but Bundestag can bypass it. Except for, again, constitutional amendments, things like changing the borders of the regions, right, of the land, remember, land is a pool of land, the region. So these things, organic laws like in France, in those cases the Bundesrat has absolute veto, meaning that it's no, cannot be bypassed. And then it goes to where? For signing. Well, not to the Chancellor. It goes to the head of state, right? So once the bill reaches the final version, it goes to the head of state, the president. Just like the monarch. Because the head of state gives the stamp of the state, gives this this stamp that is, represents a reality that is above daily politics. This is daily politics. This is the state, the ongoing reality of Germany. This is the stamp of Germany. Right? And just like the monarch, the president signs all the bills, basically. It's, it's a ceremonial, symbolic function. And then it becomes law. But very importantly, when it becomes law, as I said, it doesn't go here to be implemented, because usually it goes to the executive to implement it. That's true in the US, true in the... UK to in France. No, it goes to the individual governments here in each land because it's a federal state and it's here that implementation actually takes place. So next lecture we'll deal with that.
with the implementation. So with the administration, the bureaucracy uh, that makes uh, a law reality. This chain from idea to build to law to reality that is policy making. The link between law and reality is the administration. It's this set of institutions that penetrates the entire country, covers the entire country, which is key for the modern state, and every day works to impose those rules, those laws, right? those rules of life, from, you know, rules of traffic to taxation laws to all the rules that govern how we live together. Order is created and managed and controlled closely by the state and the modern state through the bureaucracy to the administration. And that will be our next lecture. For the, from this lecture, know the definitions we have rehashed, know the types of legislatures, bicameral, unicameral, uh, balanced, imbalanced, or balanced, unequal, and also be able to present briefly how a bill becomes law in each of these political systems. If you're asked to give an example, choose one. How does a bill become law in the US, the Germany, or France, or the UK? And understand the logic. Because here you see the three models, parliamentary, presidential, semi-presidential, in action. That's the modern state, a modern democratic state.